Welcome to A Case for America. This is Austin Hepworth. I'm here along with Michael Hepworth. And we are talking more about the Constitution, America, and the balance that we see between um, law and morality. And I realized it's been a little while since we've talked some about, um, you know, some of the song that we base this off of, the verse that says, confirm thy soul in self-control thy liberty and law and that's from america the beautiful and to us liberty is the proper balance between law and morality in society and so today we're looking at the 14th amendment and the 14th amendment we've talked some about it in previous episodes we're going to talk more about due process today so the 14th amendment specifically says that no state um, is allowed to deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. And so this there's this interesting concept called due process. And I found as an attorney, due process was one of those things in law school that was actually very difficult to come to an understanding of. Um, and I found in society, when I talk to people about the law, I hear people use the term a lot and but not in the proper context and so i think it is one that is very ingrained in american society it's in our minds we've heard of it but what is it really what is due process because it says the state can't take away life liberty or property without it which infers that if they have it if there is due process they can take away life liberty or property and so nothing is set in stone um, in America, meaning you can have everything taken from you. You can be sent to jail. You can we still have capital punishment in many states. You can be put to death. You can have your property seized. And it's not uncommon for me as an attorney to get calls from people that say, hey, I want you to make the trust for me that doesn't allow the government to touch any of my stuff. And I remember specifically one time someone called and asked for that and I said, uh, there's no such thing. And they said, no, I just listened to a guy on the radio and he explained how there's this, there's trust you can create and not even the government can take your stuff from you. And I said, there's no such thing. It really doesn't exist. Um, and they said, no, and they kept pushing it. And I finally said, well, look, if you heard the guy on the radio talk about it, then go ask him to do it for you. Don't ask me to do it. Um, and and it's it's interesting how quick we are to believe that something exists. There's some mechanism that protects our stuff so that the government can't even take it um, when we don't even understand the basic fundamentals to the law. And so, yes, we have constitutional rights. We have constitutional guarantees. Those, for the most part, can be lost. They can be waived. If you murder somebody, you have now given up your right to property. You've given up your right to liberty and potentially even your right to life. And we recognize that kind of implicitly. It's this notion inside us where we go, well, yeah, someone can go to jail. But we don't stop and think what that means. When can a law take away those things from you? And when can't it? And this is part of where due process comes in to say, the government can only take one of those three things, life, liberty, or property, if it is satisfied due process. And so if you look up due process, it's a, it gets a little hard to follow because there's two types of due process. And some sites talk about one or the other, some intermix them. Some are pretty clear on it, um, but it's kind of a mixed bag of what you get when you look at it online. The first type of due process is the most basic. It's called procedural due process. We're going to talk about procedural due process today, so we'll go into that more. The second type of due process, though, is called substantive due process. And substantive due process was the basis for the Roe v. Wade abortion decision, um, where essentially, as the judges go through and look at laws, they're looking at some type of fundamental fairness. Is the law in conjunction with something that's fair? Or, in other words, can should the government even have the right to take something from you um, without you being a criminal? 
And so, so substantive due process is looking more to this question of something that the law so far has never pushed the bounds of. Um, and that is, to what extent can the government take away certain rights or interests or privileges without a court stepping in? At some point, is there this line at which the courts say, well, that law is so bad or so unfair, we can't enforce that, it violates due process. And substantive due process is a much more nebulous area. It's been relied on in a handful of cases. It's one that courts don't love to go to because it is such a nebulous area. There's not really a lot to guide their use of it, but they still do go there sometimes. And even the gay marriage decision in 2015 relied on the substantive due process side of things. To really understand substantive due process, you really have to dive into the cases um, it's probably beyond the scope of this podcast to go there. It's more just to know that that exists, that due process is used in two ways. One is to evaluate a law and whether it's fundamentally fair or not. But even then, don't just feel like a law is unfair and you can win on substantive due process grounds. Um, it's it's pretty rare that cases win on that. And so we've got gay marriage, we've got um, things like uh, abortion or contraceptive access. But for the most part, laws can be very unfair and the courts will still uphold them because due process wasn't intended from the beginning to serve as a gauge on how appropriate or inappropriate a law is. And so courts, again, go there when it suits their fancy, but try to rarely go there. Um, and so most of the time we're stuck with laws that are unjust. So coming back to procedural due process, it then begs the question of what does due process mean? Um, and the best way to frame it is it means the government has to follow a process that's fundamentally fair um, because you're due some level of fairness or justice, the constitution says. And so the process associated with taking away your life, liberty, or property, meaning the process associated with putting you in jail or the process associated with seizing your assets and taking those from you has to be fundamentally fair. And Mike, I'm curious what you think, um, if you think it's helpful to define something like due process as fundamental fairness or how you would go about trying to evaluate you know, what what fundamental fairness would mean if you were a judge and had that question posed to you? It's an interesting topic because I think most people, probably a very large majority, would say that uh, if you're going to remove a right, there should be a fair process to it. And people agree with that statement. They agree with fair or do, this is what you deserve, this is what is owed to you. They like, we like all those words. Uh, where we start to disagree is when we try to define them. Um, so there's an interesting underlying agreement. We all want what's fair, what's right, what's owed. We like those terms. But we don't always dis we don't always agree on what that is. Um, so especially with how quickly it seems that, um, maybe not quickly, but we see as society values change over time. What is regarded as fair and owed and due possibly changes. Um, I think people have very different ideas of what is fair today than perhaps 100 years ago. Uh, and so if you're a judge and they say, hey, is this process fair? You might have to ask yourself the question, what am I basing it on? Where am I getting the idea of fairness? We all like the word fair. What am I basing it on? So you're going to make a statement in an amendment to the Constitution that says due process of law, that's probably helpful to define what you mean by due. Unfortunately, you can get deeper and deeper into that. If you define due with other words, then you may have to define those other words. And then how long is it before you're back to using the word due again? Uh, but you should probably try at some general level to say this is what is due to a citizen before we can deprive them of life, liberty, and or property. Uh, now, if you define maybe the steps, which I think maybe you'll talk about here in a minute, if you define what those things are that are due, individuals can agree or disagree with them, but at least it gives you a basis to say this is what we feel is fair. 
And then you can discuss, is this particular step fair or do we, is it not fair? Do we need another step? But if it's simply left at due process and you're a judge and that's all you have to work with, it's a difficult thing to come up and say, this individual, when they were accused of the crime, they weren't given a due process because such a thing happened. Um, each judge might have a different idea of what that is. And so coming up with kind of a criteria of some sort of what is due an individual to deprive them of life, liberty, or property would, I think, would be pretty, I would go a long way to helping us all at least get on the same page of what was considered due. And then we can debate whether those steps are appropriate or not. Yeah. Um, the one of the things I think about with it, too, is just this question of well, what's fair, um, which you alluded to. But I look at my kids and you know, I'm a father of eight children. And I don't know if I've ever been able to make a decision that they all agreed was fair. <laughs> Usually there's somebody that feels it's unfair because they're losing something or didn't go the way they wanted and someone else got what they wanted and and it's not fair, they say. And I really started to think about that. I thought, well, what is fairness? When we talk about it, what are we talking about? What's the human need or emotion or what's the concept we're, we're shooting for with what's fair or just or do? And it's been interesting to me to watch society change where I was even listening to a group of people talk. They were debating about whether you could be a good Christian or follower of God if you ate animals. Um, and I was more just interested in the conversation, kind of tuning in. Um, I personally believe you can eat meat and still worship God just fine. But um, they were talking about things, and one of them had mentioned how um, at a church, some kind of church activity, they had killed a pig to teach the kids what it was like back for people 100, 200 years ago, and how they felt that the spirit left and they couldn't feel spiritual things after this pig was killed, and how they felt that was a sign that, you know, the spirit of God wasn't with people. They killed animals. And in part, I had to look at that and say, you know, I think part of that is that our notion of justice or fairness or what's appropriate has changed, where just to live, people used to have to kill animals all the time. And now we can live in a society where someone else does that for us. We don't have to see it. We don't have to experience it. And we start to become less um, accepting of the killing of an animal and it becomes harder for us to stomach. And I've wondered if the same type of thing happens with justice, where before societies had a, for example, if you murdered someone, you may have a trial, maybe, but you'd be lynched or hung or shot or whatever pretty quickly. Um, now it takes 40 years if you're going to have capital punishment. And even then there's so much arguments against it, so many people are so appalled by it, that this notion of justice or fairness is radically changing. And even the notion of justice is becoming very hard for people to swallow, where we have laws and they have impact and we want some people to suffer extensively. You know, if there's a teacher that says something inappropriate in class, we'll call for them to be fired for life and never be a teacher again. Um, and for some reason, we're okay with that but we struggle putting someone in jail for attacking somebody. We say, oh, they're mentally ill. We got to give them grace. Like, this is really difficult. And it's been interesting to me to watch as society's change to say, well, what is justice? What are we really talking about? Because is justice something that can be, oh, yeah, it used to be just to kill animals. It's not anymore for food. Um, and would justice change that way or would fairness say, oh yeah, it used to be okay to put someone to death within two weeks of them killing someone else, but now we have to put them in jail for life because we're just not okay with what's happening. And I've been very interested by that to wonder if as a society, 
as we are exposed less and less to justice, if we become repulsed by justice, or what used to be justice at least. And I think one of the, the most interesting pieces of that is we all agree that there is, most of us agree there is a justice, there is a right uh, and a wrong. And like the first thing you do when you feel somebody's wronged you, if somebody takes something away from you, you usually say, that's not fair, that's not just. <clears throat> um, and so there's this baseline where we all agree. And then as soon as we say, yes, but what is just, it starts to go all over the place. And I think that's partially due to our changing in our kind of changing in our beliefs, what's driving our beliefs, because what you believe is just and not just depends entirely on um, a, a belief system. You're, you're looking at something beyond yourself, transcend it to human beings to say there's some level that sits above all human beings that is just or not just right or wrong. And as individuals have different ideas and ideas really start to um, differentiate, we really start to disagree about what is just. We look at in a society where we can spend more and more time um, not providing for ourselves, we can provide for ourselves in smaller amounts of time than it used to be 150 years ago. We have more and more time to look at every minute thing. We say in this little area, in a teacher at school, what's just and what not just? And we can argue about every little thing and um, we really start to see the propagation of the differences in our beliefs as we try to figure out. We all agree there's justice, but as our uh, our beliefs on what drives justice change, uh, we we don't we can't quite get on the same page of understanding as what uh, how that's defined and how it's made up. Yeah. Yeah. And so. So due process by nature is a concept that has been changing over time. Um, where some parts of it hold solid. So, for example, at the core of due process, there's a couple things. Um, the generally at the core of due process, you're innocent until proven guilty. And so the government has the burden of proving that you did something wrong. And they generally have a standard. So in criminal cases, they have a beyond a reasonable doubt standard. Some other types of cases, they may have clear and convincing evidence type standards. Um, you generally have a right to counsel in any proceeding in which you're accused of something. So if the government's trying to take away your life, liberty, or property, you generally can have an attorney there. Now, this one thing to understand about this is we're talking about due process applying at the point of enforcement. So this is when they're enforcing it against you. Um, you often have the right to cross-examine witnesses, the right to a hearing prior to them actually taking the thing away, um, the right to have a neutral person that makes the judicial decision. So meaning a judge that's not, that doesn't work with the prosecutor or isn't your friend kind of thing. They're just supposed to be neutral. Um, and the right to be present when evidence is being presented against you. Now, some of these rights exist in other areas of the Constitution. And so due process doesn't necessarily invent these. As judges looked at it, they kind of said, well, yeah, since the Constitution guarantees that, that means if you don't have it, due process would be violated because that's one of our basic notions of fairness. Um, and so, but typically as it plays out in practice, the government has to provide notice of the charges against you. They need to cite to a law that's not too vague to understand what it is and what's taking place. You have to have an opportunity to rebut the charges, to present opposing evidence. That's where the hearing comes in. Um, and, and ultimately the government has to offer some justification to the judge if the justification is questioned about the law or why they're doing what they're doing. Um, and that's particularly true with any type of area that may infringe on constitutional rights. The government has to have a reason for the law. And so we have these these basic notions that stay in there. And I think so far most people agree that those are good, but then you start to put specifics in and you say, well, what about the guy that is caught driving drunk? 
the police pull him over and he's there drunk as a skunk on the side of the road. Can the police arrest him without a hearing? Can they take his car away without a hearing? Can they take his driver's license away without a hearing? And I think most people go, well, yeah. Like, don't let that guy back in the car. And you say, well, with due process, it says, if you're supposed to have these things before, you know, a hearing before they take away your property, what do we do in those situations? And it's interesting to look at how the law has worked on it. Judges have said, yeah, even though those are the basic requirements, the general requirements, there'll be exceptions. And we need to get drunk drivers off the road. So yeah, they can take their car, they can take their license, they can put them in jail without a hearing, just based on what the police officer feels. Um, and I don't hear any large outcry from people saying that's so wrong. That's a violation of due process rights. And it goes back to this thing because people say, well, that's fundamentally fair. We don't want these drunk drivers out on the road. We need to do something about it quickly. And if they're failing the breathalyzer test, then they shouldn't be out there. And so courts, as they look at situations one by one, they have dispensed with the hearing requirement. Now you have to have a hearing at some point um, during this process, but when that is exactly, those are pieces that still get figured out. States can push that around and try and make it difficult for you if you're found drunk on the side of the road. Now it is interesting too, because I don't know if you've noticed, at least in Utah, I'm pretty sure it's this way in most states because they talk about it, at least in the articles I read, when you sign for your driver's license, you actually say, I consent to take a breathalyzer test when asked. In exchange for the right to get this license, you have the right essentially to inspect me. And they do that to try and help get around the Fourth Amendment. Because um, the Fourth Amendment doesn't allow them to do some of these things without, you know, they need warrants for probable cause and or they need probable cause for warrants, warrants to search, different things. And so they just say, hey, if you're gonna get a license, you consent. Now, I personally have extreme issues with the government circumventing some constitutional rights by saying, oh, if you want this privilege, we're gonna require by law that you have a license if you wanna drive. But if you want the license, you have to waive your constitutional rights. And I go, that doesn't feel right to me at all. If you just want to say that they have the right to force me to take a breathalyzer test or take my license from me, okay, maybe we can talk about that being appropriate. But the notion that you can make me sign in an application that, yeah, I'll waive this right and I'll waive that right. And yeah, sure, because I want my license so much. That means the state could license any activity like they do with businesses. They say, hey, you want to even people don't realize how extensively the state licenses stuff, but if you want to have more than two garage sales a year in most cities, you have to have a business license for it. And um, so if you have in your third, you know, garage sale, you need to have a business license. But to get the business license, you're signing because you don't have to have the license, they say. And I look at that and go, that's just a basic right of existing that I can sell something to you if I want to. And yet the government can license that activity. And if we allow the government to say, but if you want to do this, you got to waive these rights. To me, it feels like it's circumventing the Constitution. And that doesn't feel like due process to me. Because the process is due, from my perspective, you know, no matter what you, what privilege you want from the government or not, if the government's the one forcing me to have the privilege, so just saying, if you want to drive, you got to do this, I have issues with them, then making conditions on my granting of that privilege. Um, so that's an aside for me, um, something you can think about. But with due process and this hearing requirement, you start to see different contexts. You see schools where since the school is run by the government, can you suspend a student without a hearing? And generally the courts have kind of come down and said, yeah, 10 days or less, sure. They just kind of need an informal hearing, something real quick that the principal looks at. Um, but if it's more than 10 days, yeah, that's pretty serious. So they should have a right to a hearing. 
Um, and again, we see this balance where the courts are trying to strike something that they feel is fair. And that fairness is always based on levels of societal morality. And even with the capital punishment and what process is fair, right now someone that's being put to death is given years and years and years and years and years of appeals in the legal system. 100 years ago, 150 years ago, they would have been put to death pretty quickly. Um, and due process would have been considered satisfied. So, and that's one area we can see a massive, massive shift in the process that's due um, and courts interpreting things differently there. Um, one of the things that, so I guess there's a couple of things that due process does. And one is, that due process is the reason, or one of the reasons, not the only reason, but a reason why sexual offenses tend to be underreported and under prosecuted. Because for the victim of a sexual offense, they have to relive everything to be able to testify in court. They often have to be subject to physical examinations. Um, so there can be some kind of proof put up. And these are situations where it's very much often a he said, she said type scenario. And it just makes it really difficult. But if you're accused of sexual harassment or sexual assault or something, you still have the right to be presumed innocent. The government has to prove the charges against you, which means they need the victim to be able to come testify. That often is difficult to do. It's difficult to relive that, to go through that, to talk about that. And, and so we live in a world where, you know, they want to really increase the offense or increase the penalty associated with an offense. They want to make it so there's a lot less of these crimes by making more and more laws. But this is an area where I think for both Michael and I, we don't believe that the law is going to change what's happening. If we want to change what's happening, people already know that things are wrong that they're doing. They know that it's illegal. And increasing the penalty from two years to four years or four years to eight years isn't going to change what people do or don't do. That's a morality perspective. Um, and we have to be aware that Sometimes the law is powerless to change conduct. Um, you know, people talk about this with the death penalty. They say, oh, the death penalty doesn't serve as a deterrent because people will still kill people. And certainly, people will still kill people no matter what the laws are against it. Are there some people that maybe choose otherwise because of the death penalty? Maybe. You know, we don't know what it would be like if we didn't have it. Um, because we haven't experienced that yet here in America. But for the most part, people are making that decision based on what they morally know is right. And there's still a, a level of morality in society where most people don't. They just choose not to kill other people. And it's not something based on the law. It's not something based on punishment as much as it is a moral decision. Um, and so if we want to change what people do, we push for a strong moral change in America to recognize what's appropriate, what's not appropriate. And people often say, that's too hard, takes too much work, I can't change other people. Um, but I've even been interested just with the push against a lot of the racism or things that take place. Decidedly, it's become very unacceptable to say certain things that used to be said quite a bit. And they haven't necessarily been outlawed, um, but society has stopped tolerating it. People have stopped tolerating it. And that is more powerful than a law because there's not police everywhere. There's not you know cameras everywhere, video recording everything, but there are people most everywhere. And if we personally choose to say, well, we don't put up with that, that's not acceptable. Um, we can make a difference in telling people what's moral and what's not moral. And that's something we should always remember. Um, 
And Michael, I don't know if you have thoughts on law and its ability to solve all problems or any of that connection to due process there. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting conversation because lots of people want, um, when they when they look at the application of the law, they want justice to be served is a, one of the ways they look at it. Uh, and by that, some people mean an individual who breaks a law receives some sort of just due. Um, they still, therefore, they lose property rights. You know, it's, it's almost like justice demands that there's some sort of punishment. And then, and then others want that punishment to be um, a deterrent to others in the future to not steal. And I think <clears throat> the deterrent side is tricky because I, I wouldn't say that laws don't deter. I think they do deter to some degree. Um, but a good example of this is look at people driving on the freeway. And <clears throat> I know it's become an issue more recently. Um, police departments across the country are talking about how speeds just seem to be increasing. Um, I hear individuals in states make the claim that their state is the worst, but this is a problem across the country. Uh, people are just driving faster and faster on the freeway. Tickets for speeding are registering higher and higher speeds all the time. Um, you could deter speeding um, with a law. You could say, we're just going to put a police officer up on a hill above a freeway. Anybody that their radar shows going five over, they're just going to shoot them. I got a sniper rifle. And that would probably deter a whole lot of speeding. If you knew that you could just get shot when you were speeding, that's probably a pretty good example of deterrent. But it's also a great example of how harsh a law has to be sometimes to create a deterrent. <clears throat> and so when we're trying to balance um, our liberties and law and deterrence, we have to decide, is that the kind of world we want to live in? Where the only way to deter is to have the strictest penalty you can think of? Or are we going to try to fight something at a societal level, like where you talked about, where we're trying to instill some moral values? I don't know that without the heaviest hand of the law, you're going to deter all kinds of uh, problems. You're just not going to. Uh, without the law becoming so invasive that everybody wears a camera, um, you're not going to solve a lot of issues. And even if everybody wears a camera, you're going to have disagreements. I think a great place to look is at sports. They they now use instant replay in most sports, um, and yet referee controversies are still as big as they've ever been. I don't know that it solved much of anything as far as fans' anger at the referees or um, getting the correct call. And so it, you can get really invasive and still not solve the problem. So at some point, we have to say, at a law, we want laws that when somebody does something wrong, we look to, maybe for lack of a better term, we look to punish that because that's what's right. Somebody is taking somebody else's property. Um, we shouldn't allow that person to be able to continue to do so. There needs to be some sort of law applied to say, hey, you can't do that. You need to return it. You need, you need Now you can't participate fully in society because you made this decision. But you're not going to be able to fully deter without a really heavy hand. And so at some level, like we talk about with the balance, can we get our can we work together as a society to build up our moral values and say one of the best deterrences is just how we interact with each other and how we treat one another. Yeah. Um, and it is interesting to think about from the substantive due process side. So again, this is the side that says, is there a point at which a law becomes so unfair that a court will strike it down? if the law said yes yeah, capital punishment for speeding and it's just execute any speeder a judge might look at that and say whoa that's far too extreme we obviously have the eighth amendment that says no cruel and unusual punishment no excessive fines and so maybe they'd rely on the eighth amendment but they also may say mm, you can't the, the penalty's got to fit the crime to some extent you know you can't just take away someone's life over this um, but that's that's a question that always tugs at judges throughout these cases is, is there some type of outer boundary? And I actually believe it's going to be tested more and more um, <clears throat> as we get <clears throat> leaders that do wilder and wilder things 
or things that are more outside the bounds of what was normally accepted before, it's going to be tested more and more often. And if you look at Trump, for example, he's claiming right now he should be immune as president when he was president from actions then, no matter how egregious or bad the actions were. And that is something that you know people can agree, disagree on. They can have all kinds of merits for. Um, but it is it is kind of looking to say we're we're getting to places where the law is going one of two ways. Either it's saying yeah, do whatever you want, which also feels like a little bit outside due process, or we want to come down so hard on you and punish you so badly because you did something wrong. And I even look at things. There's a new federal law in place called the Corporate Transparency Act. And it, if you don't register with the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network of the federal government as a small business owner, tell them who you are, where you live, all these things, they can come after you for every day you're late and fine you up to $500. And they can put you in jail for up to two years for not sending them a report. And to me, that seems pretty wild. That's a lot of money. You know, imagine if you moved and you had to update your driver's license address and you forgot to do it and you were getting fined $500 a day. That's a lot of money. And at what point is there a level at which these things, these two things have to align? And again, that's a question for substantive due process as informed by things like the Eighth Amendment, some of these other amendments that they look at. Um, but procedurally, so long as the government post the law. If a law is posted, the court says you have notice of it. The government's done its job of providing notice of the laws. And then, so if they don't post a law and it's not publicly available, then you could argue, whoa, this law is secret. They can't enforce this law against me. And you'd have a decent due process argument. The law, though, also has to spell out that what you did is wrong. You need to be able to look at a law and understand what it requires. Um, so if the law simply said, don't be a jerk or else you can go to jail, you go, well, what does that mean? Um, that wouldn't be specific enough. It'd be considered too vague. And so the law could be struck down as being unconstitutionally vague because you don't know what it means. And so the law has to give you reasonable grounds to understand what it means. And so the law tries to define almost anything and everything. And these laws get super long, super expensive. And if they fail to cover one particular point, we then get what are called loopholes because due process says, yeah, they didn't address it. So someone doesn't have notice of it, so you can't enforce it against them until it's properly passed by the legislature. Um, so the law has to fill out items. And I think in America, we're on the side of maybe a little too much protection for that, where our laws have to be so detailed and granular that it becomes burdensome because of how detailed and granular they are. And I think it's probably appropriate to have a little bit more flexibility than our law gives most of the time under this. Um, but it's not where we're at. And so the laws are very, very spelled out. Another thing that happens with due process is when it talks about this neutral judge, um, this is one of the reasons why the founders had such a big fight over whether, over how you deal with judges and their appointment. Should a judge be appointed for life? Should they be subject to election? Should they be in for a certain amount of time and kicked out? Ultimately, the founders for federal judges said they need to be in for life because we don't want them to feel pressure from the government from anyone else that they're going to lose their job if they rule a certain way. They wanted them to be able to rule based on what was actually there. And most states, though, have not accepted that. And states are uncomfortable with lifetime appointments. And so states have it anywhere from straight up judge just has to run for election and judges get elected to a state like Utah where the judge is appointed by the governor, but then they go up for re-election or retention vote. Not re-election, but retention vote every seven or 10 years. And these judges, 
will show up on the ballot and we'll say, should this judge be retained as a judge? Everyone in Utah virtually votes yes. It's almost no check and balance. Um, and I mean, there's, I don't know, maybe 20, 25% of the population that says no, but judges don't usually get kicked out. And, but if you look at it, you could say, well, if a judge does feel pressure to get reelected, is it going to change how they rule in a case? Do you truly have an impartial judge if they feel these pressures from outside? The courts so far have allowed these judges to be elected. Um, but Michael, I think you had pointed out in one of our conversations before that there's old Western movies about judges that are up for election and they've got to satisfy the mob and appease them and things. And so, so there's certainly interests that can come in and other pressures that can come in that can affect par impartiality or make them more partial to certain sides. Um, federal level, some people like their constitutional cases at the federal level a lot more because the judges are more insulated from that. They don't have that political pressure because once you're in, as a judge, you're in unless you do something really stupid and break some big law and get impeached. Um, but otherwise, you're in for life or until you want to be done. So these are these are some of the pieces of kind of how due process affects some aspects of our society. It also affects things like tenure in universities. If you're an untenured professor, you can be fired. But if you're a tenured professor, you have to have a hearing and notice what you did wrong and things because tenure gives you what they call a property interest. And that protects the due process clause protects life, liberty, or property. The government can't take it from you. And so they can't just take your tenure from you unless they um, go through the hearing, satisfy procedural due process. And so I guess on that last bit, just to mention the government does look at tenure or sorry, look at property rights versus privileges. And you don't have to, there's not as much protection for a privilege being taken away because it's not a property right. A property right is something you're guaranteed. And so that'd be something you own, something you have some type of ownership interest in. Um, a liberty interest that's protected is something that's basically guaranteed by the US Constitution. And so the government can't take that away without procedural due process or your life which is they can't take that away from you. They can't put you to death without due process. But again, we recognize exceptions to all these based on reality. If you're shooting people, the police can come in and just shoot you and you're dead and there was no hearing, no anything else, and there's no due process violation at that point. So remember that what's considered fair for a situation will always prevail and that will change with society. And just a quick point of clarification, when you discussed tenure, you were talking about government uh, owned institutions. Uh, many times privately owned institutions will build these kinds of due process ideas into contracts, but this is specifically government action against professors. And that I think goes across the board with what we're talking about. Yeah, and it is a good point. Due process is only when the government's taking it away from you. So if it's a government university, they can't fire a tenured professor without these due process hearings um, that are guaranteed by the procedural due process, essentially. If it's a private employer, truly private university with no public funds and no government control, that's different. And, but like you say, unions, others, private parties will sometimes put these into contracts with other people, with other private parties to get the same rights. So you might see them modeled after due process they're required by contract as opposed to the actual constitution in those private situations. Um, but ultimately, due process is something that's really helped set America apart from the beginning where the kings couldn't just make laws because they didn't like you. The law had to be in place before. You had to have notice of it. They had to try and prove it. You're innocent until proven guilty. Right to counsel, right to attorneys there, right to cross-examine and things. And it creates a check and balance on the government and the power of law to just crush you or because you oppose the king to put you in jail. And it, due process really helped make America a land that's ruled by law as opposed to ruled by the whims of a dictator who might feel one thing one day and one thing another. 
and the rule of law is really something that helps America be what it is, that we have some level of certainty in what's taking place because there is law, it has to be there in order for the government to do something to take these things away from you. And so due process helps enforce our system of property rights, even against the government. Um, and so going back to the example of people asking me what's, you know, they want the trust that makes it so the government can't touch them. That doesn't exist because any of your property is subject to be lost if it doesn't follow the laws of the land, such as paying property taxes, for example. But when the government has restrictions and hoops has to jump through, it really helps create the system of property rights where you can be assured that as so long as you do certain things, that property is yours. And that formed the basis for a lot of our capitalist system, a lot of our economy, a lot of things that have taken place to the point where the whole world has a lot of faith and credit, even in the US, because it's ruled by law. And so people buy the American treasury bonds and the T-bills and other things that American currency forms the basis of this because America is so strong at respecting these property rights and following the laws. So the rule of law has made America a trusted country. And this notion of due process, while it seems simple in some ways, procedural due process, right to a hearing, it transcends into even the American dollar being used around the world as the basis for most of what takes place because of how strong America is at protecting these rights and the laws need to be in place first so people know what they can or can't expect. So we appreciate you joining us this week um, as we talk about due process. And we will come back next week, talk about some more of the Constitution and the amendments and continue this discussion. But ultimately, we feel very strongly that America is an amazing nation, an amazing place. We have a lot to celebrate here, a lot to build on, and a lot to work on and improve. We're not a perfect country, but we shouldn't throw away the good we have based on bad that exists. We should work to improve the bad and build on the good. And this notion of due process is one that we should continue to build on and keep as a foundation for checks and balances and a healthy legal system. So we will follow up more next week. Thanks so much. Yeah.